Virtual reality is a technology. Remember, you heard it here first. <laughs> virtual reality is a technology which is developing at lightning speed. And it basically involves a helmet and a glove. And you put on the helmet and you put on the glove and you throw a switch and you're in another reality, a virtual reality. And you can feel objects in this reality through your glove because the glove has sensors embedded into it which react to a complex computer program which tells the glove to bend as though it were gripping a ball. And then you feel a doorknob in the virtual reality and you open a door and walk through and so forth. And the, the people who are developing this have great hopes for it, uh, clearly to make money, which it obviously will. But we here under this tree are sophisticated McLuhanists and understand that media always has a feedback loop into cultural self-image and that we cannot put on a Dior gown without feeling like uh, a party where that would be appropriate. And what virtual reality holds out the possibility of that these people have clearly grasped is we are going to be able to show each other our fantasies. Of course, yes, all the trivial ones first, but then everything else, you know, and here is a tremendous dimension in which art can function. Uh, imagine if we each could show each other our dreams. What an enriching thing that would be for design in other words, for the topological manifold of visible culture, because we see all these things in our dreams. But I think that this is only a trivial aspect of what virtual reality will make possible, because the people who are associated with it are no strangers, I think, to psychedelic perspectives. One of the strange things that happens in the DMT intoxication is... Um, this language which is seen, not heard, these elf-like creatures in this other dimension have a syntactical way of communicating which is visible. They don't communicate with sound, they communicate with light, which condenses into these crystalline, toy-like, semi-organic, self-transforming, highly colored things. Those are syntactical structures of some sort. They mean something. Well, from you've heard me talk about the communication systems of octopi, that octopi have this very highly evolved nervous system, and all over the surface of their skin there are what are called chromatophores, specialized cells which can change color. And octopi, when they wish to communicate, they have traveling bars, blushes, dots, stripes, all this stuff flowing over the surface of their skin, well, notice that they become their syntactical intent. That's what's actually happening here. They are not, as we do, our method of communication is to make small mouth noises, which are transduced across space as sound, reconstructed in the brain of the hearer, and then a dictionary is consulted, and the commonest meaning chosen for the incoming sound. As ways of conveying information go, this is what you call a very low-grade signal. It's a miserable way to transfer data. But if you could see what, we, what I mean, if I could literally cause my uh, concrescent intention to appear before us and rotate like an object in space, we could take a step forward toward telepathy. Well, in the virtual reality, paint boxes and toolkits are being created in the software realm that will allow people, Jared Lanier, the great uh, brain behind some of this, is interested in what he calls non-symbolic communication. Non-symbolic communication and the more perfect logos of the DMT ecstasis are the same thing. It's a moving, visible modality of intent that you see, you don't hear. 
So I think the virtual reality opens up the possibility that, uh, you know, my mother used to say, if wishes were horses, beggars would ride. I actually look forward to that day. I believe that that's within reach, you know. Anybody else? Dylanic. It's a term that Rianne Eisler introduced in her book, The Chalice of the, and the Blade, and it means related to Gaia, related to the goddess. Have you all read The Chalice and the Blade? No. It does all this spade work for me. Rianne and I appeared right here a year ago. She's a brilliant woman. She's a born in Vienna, an archaeologist, has given her life to understanding Middle Eastern prehistory, the archaeology of it. And it is when we talk of dominator uh, versus partnership societies, we're using Rianne Eisler's words. You see, we want to get completely away from the gender polarity of talking about a matriarchy versus a patriarchy. First of all, there is very little evidence for a true matriarchy. Uh, what seems to have happened is that there was this thing called a partnership society, which gave way to male dominance, dominator society. But in the original hunting-gathering thing, that equation was fairly well balanced. Uh, the men hunted, the women gathered. There was pressure on the women to develop language. This they did. This allowed them the notion of agriculture and pastoralism and the husbandry of cattle and uh, a, a cycle of nomadism based on mushroom use, husbandry of cattle, and a mixed hunting and gathering ecology was what existed in Eden, really. And then the story I told you of the drying. You know, if you look at the story of Genesis, it is very clearly the story of a drug bust. I mean, <laughs> this woman ate of the fruit of the tree of life and she gave it to her, and then there was this problem. And Jehovah, musing to himself, says, they must not do this, because if they do, they will become as we are. Not it's bad, or it's poisonous, or they'll make themselves sick, but they will become as we are. Well, how plain does it have to be, people? I mean, it's right there embedded in the urtext of Western civilization. The story of the woman's fascination with the dimension brought by the plant and how this had to be suppressed in order that everything could be a bring down for thousands of years. <laughs> but Terence, my dear, there are two, I know of two tribes still in existence, which are matriarchal in Paraguay. Yes, I think it happens. It's not a hard but, and fast rule. Because, but as a matter of fact, they're in terrible trouble if they still exist. Because the Amish went in and took them over. <laughs> the Amish. And they were, they were so confused. I, last I heard, they were in very bad shape psychologically. Yes, well, wherever these dominator philosophies have gone, and, you know, I, I wrap monotheism very heavily, but I also think, you know, modern science is the bastard child of, of Christian theology. I mean, all that rummaging around by Thomas Aquinas and Francis Bacon entirely set the stage for modern science. I mean, here is Francis Bacon on nature. Nature must be put on the rack that we may torture from her her secrets. This is Francis Bacon, the, the father of modern science. I mean, is this a dominator, woman-hating, misogynist vision or what? And this, this was done, you know, and the secrets were tortured. And now we hold, you know, the power to light the fire of stars on the cities of our enemies. But to what end? Why would it? Yeah. Why would the plant call us into consciousness? 
Well, it's you know, or maybe you don't know, but in the in the introduction to the book that Dennis and I wrote on how to grow mushrooms, the mushroom makes a little speech there. It says, "I am old, fifty times older than thought in your species. I come from the stars, yet I've been on Earth for ages, so forth and so on." And there it says, "What you have that I want is hands. You have hands. You can move matter." I am like a cobweb spread through the soil. I am so diaphanous. I touch the earth so lightly. And then why? What are these hands for? Well, then you touch on this peculiar theme in the mushroom, which is its apocalyptic uh, tendencies, its millenarian tendencies. Um, it sees the solar life as circumscribed. It thinks in terms of a cosmic, a, a galactic radiation of its genes through space and time. It doesn't want to be trapped on one mud ball when uh, the star that it's orbiting goes up. This question of the dynamics of the sun is very interesting. I don't know why, you know, the the alien thing that it is, why it would call us forth into organization it there are some things that are hard to that we can't comprehend i mean when you confront the other and you begin to dialogue with it about these things and it begins to lift the veil on these vistas it becomes unbearable ultimately symbiotic ultimately symbiotic and ultimately somehow for purposes of departure, the theme of departure, whether it's to another continuum uh, that a doorway will open and we'll go, th or down into the crystalline substructure of the planet, or into the wind, uh, it's. But the theme is that we are finished here. It's interesting that these plants have these messages because I don't get this from ayahuasca. To me, ayahuasca is maternal and the river and I often see flow flow sediment the rivers the sediment the overturning of minerals life and death and but not this let us go where no one has ever gone before on your feet mankind the great adventure it ta -da, ta -da, and it begins to you know march out into this uh, inflated but perhaps true uh, vision of a destiny for us that we have a destiny that there is more more for us than saving this planet that must be done but Maybe it's a test, you know, save your planet, and then we'll talk to you.